with IV of Alpha Lapoic, low dose naltrexone. He has been doing this since 1979. 77. <laughs> <laughs> I have typographical error in my book. <laughs> so please, without further ado, welcome Dr. Burke Berkson. Thank you very much for inviting me. I um, really like New Jersey. Uh, one of my first jobs was a professor at Rutgers uh, in 1968. And my daughter was uh, born about 10 miles from here in Livingston, New Jersey, at St. Barnabas Hospital. So I have nice thoughts about this uh, state. Well, uh, you can't hear me back there? Okay. Can you guys hear me now in the back? Yes, okay. All right. Um, well, first of all, I'm probably a very different type of a, a doctor, an, an MD. Uh, I started medical school in Chicago right out of college and uh, very young, immature. And uh, I used to ask questions all the time. They always told me to be quiet. And uh, one day the professor came up to me and he said, you know, we don't ask questions in medicine. We give you information, you memorize it, you give it back to us just the way we give it to you, then you're an MD. And you know, that's, this sort of bothered me even as a young, young man. And I didn't like having to wear a tie every day. At the, in those years, you had to wear a tie and you had to get it. I was always getting on the elevator before the chiefs and that always upset them. And I quit. And I went to uh, graduate school at the University of Illinois. I got a master's degree, a PhD, in an area of cell biology and microbiology. And I became a professor at Rutgers University. And um, then many, th many things happened. Uh, I remember I had, a, um, I had relatives in Chicago who uh, were having problems with doctors, and I'd call them up. They never had time to talk. And I thought, well, maybe I'll... Um, I'll pick up an MD as a sideline and never practice, but have a lot more power at the universities and a lot more money. <clears throat> and uh, I eventually ended up in Cleveland uh, at one of the Case Western Reserve Medical Schools and went, finished up there and went into their internal medicine program. And I was there for a very short time when I started driving everybody crazy and they were driving me crazy. Uh, the chief of medicine came up to me one day and said, I'm really upset with you. You don't have any deaths on your service. You'll never win the Black Crow Award. And I said, well, aren't I supposed to keep people alive? He said, in these big institutions, you get to practice a lot, and every once in a while you kill somebody. Everybody's seen several deaths, and you've seen zero. I've never seen this before. So we're going to give you two people who will surely die. They ate poisonous mushrooms. They'll be dead in two weeks. Go upstairs, watch them die, take notes, and present it to Grand Medical Rounds in two weeks when they die. So how do you know they're going to die in two weeks? Well, our experts said so. You don't trust experts? No. Well, what kind of a person are you? So, well, I only expect to do a year or two of this uh, residency, and I expect to go back to a professorship. He says, take my word for it, they'll be dead in two weeks. They ate poisonous mushrooms, and this is the worst thing that could happen to a liver. No one can survive this without a, a transplant. So I went upstairs, this is 1977, and uh, looked at these two sick people. And as a good doctor, I should have sat down, take notes, watched them die. But as a uh, scientist, 
I called Washington, D.C., spoke to the head of our National Institutes of Health, Dr. Fred Barter, and I asked him, is there anything in the world that will regrow a liver? He said he was studying alpha-lipoic acid as the wonder drug for the reversal of diabetes and diabetic neuropathies and retinopathies. He said, but when they give it to people with diabetes, they seem to regrow their organs. It stimulates stem cells to regenerate tissues. He sent me two cases, picked it up at the airport, ran back to the hospital, checked into the two people. Within two, within two weeks, they regrow their livers. And I suspect they're in their late 80s now, still with no liver damage. Dr. Barter from Washington was so impressed, he came out with a group from, from um, Washington, from the National Institutes of Health, to uh, set up a national conference in um, Cleveland on organ regeneration, asked me to be the lead speaker. The chiefs were really angry. They said, we told the families they'd be dead in two weeks, they're alive and well, you made us look like fools. And you use a drug that wasn't on our formulary. I said, well, the formulary committee doesn't meet for a month. He said, you know, probably I would have been fired on that day, but Dr. Barter and the National Institutes of Health took me under their wing. And uh, we, we gave it to 79 people with end-stage liver disease waiting for transplants and couldn't get them. And within, I'd say a month, 75 out of 79 regrew their livers. Now, you would think this would be accepted right away, and people would get all excited about it, out of, out of the most prestigious place in the world, National Institutes of Health, out of um, Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Clinic Hospitals. I wrote a short note for the New England Journal of Medicine. It was published. And every time I saw a, um, a liver doctor, they said, you're not a liver doctor. You have no right to do this. Stay out of our business. You know what I, you want to know what I did? No. We, don't, we have no interest in what you're doing. Then uh, Dr. Barter and I were invited to be visiting scientists in Germany. We went over there. It became a big drug over there. Uh, I, he and I wrote um, three publications that were um, published in, big, in uh, big symposium journals. When I got back to Cleveland, I was told, you can't talk about this anymore in Cleveland. I said, why? So whenever you see a big institution with maybe 15 blocks of hospitals, hotels, restaurants, thousands of employees, we don't support this by regrowing livers. We regrow the liver, we lose the patient. If we transplant the liver, we make a half a million dollars in two weeks, and we have a short leash on them for the rest of their lives. So you're a professor, you're not a doctor as far as we're concerned. Teach our students about germs, that's what you're an expert in. You have anything you want. Continue saying people can regrow an organ without a transplant will destroy your career. And you know, I grew up on the streets of Chicago and I didn't let these guys scare me. And I kept doing what I was doing anyway. Then, um, then I got a uh, call from one of the big, big uh, institutions, I won't name it, I can tell you personally later on. Um, the uh, head of medicine there called me up and said, you think it would work for the reversal of diabetes and diabetic neuropathies? He said, we have 1,500 people here, no, 1,200 people here, waiting to have their toes amputated. Think it would work for this? So yeah, I think it would. So I sent them, I think it was 100 cases. I was the Food and Drug Administration chief scientist for this as a prescription drug by that time. And then a few years later, I read this article that this group had taken 1,200 people, waited to have the toes amputated, gave nothing but intravenous lipoic acid. Within three weeks, they grew new blood vessels, new nerves in the toes, and did not require amputation. So I thought, well, finally, it's going to become a prescription drug. They stopped doing it. So I called a drug company. I told them I was the Food and Drug Administration chief, chief uh, person for this. Why did they stop? And the vice president looked at me and said, or told me over the phone, he says, you know, off the record, 
you know, this is a big place. If they regrow the toes, they lose the patient. If they cut them off, they make a lot of money. They come back next year, have a foot amputated, then a lower leg, then an upper limb, then the other side. Your drug's bad for their business. That's why they stopped. So um, I said, well, they had such great results. Are you going to put it on the market as a prescription drug? And he said, look, we basically want one drug for one indication. Your drug is too good. If we give it for diabetic neuropathies and retinopathies, it also very effectively lowers blood sugar. So we lose our money on our insulin products. It changes cancer metabolism from anaerobic or without oxygen to aerobic. Cancer cells die from this, we lose money on our chemotherapy. It gets in the heart and chelates the calcium in the, in the coronary arteries and lose money on our heart drugs. It regrows the liver and lungs. This is the most horrible drug that has ever been around. It'll never get on the market. And then a few weeks later, I get this, call, this uh, letter from the Food and Drug Administration saying, you are fired. You're no longer the uh, chief investigator. So anyway, I got so fed up with uh, university work and became a country doctor uh, not far from Lubbock, Texas. My kids thought we were cowboys and cowgirls. Um, then a job opened up uh, in the El Paso area uh, with William Bowman Army Hospital and uh, McAfee Hospital in, uh, near Las Cruces, and I took that job. And then about 20-some years ago, I decided I was going to open a little office, do what I think is right, not fight with people anymore. And we have people from all over the world coming in, all word of mouth. Um, right after I opened up, a man walked in with a walker, could hardly even move. He said MD Anderson told him he had only a few weeks to live. He had prostate cancer in his bones. He had rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus. I said, what could I do for you? He said, well, can you give me pain pills? He wanted to put his wife in a home before he died. I said, sure. Then he asked me if I ever heard of Dr. Beharry in New York. He said, no. He said, he heard Dr. Beharry was stopping the growth of cancer and curing rheumatoid disease, autoimmune disease. So I said, why don't you go up there and see him? He says, well, he's just in a little office in New York. If he's any good, wouldn't he be at uh, Sloan Kettering or Dana Carver? I said, if he could cure cancer, he'd probably put him out of business. They treat cancer. They don't cure a lot of cancers. And I told him how they wanted to kill me in Cleveland because I was regrowing livers rather than transplanting them. He went up and saw Dr. Bahari. And... Um, about three years later, he walks in without his walker. I thought he died. He said, but here he stopped the growth of the cancer, stopped the rheumatoid disease with a drug that costs $20 a month, low-dose naltrexone. And I was very skeptical. I gave it to a lot of people with uh, lupus, MS, dermatomyositis, rheumatoid arthritis. And the majority of people got better right away. And uh, next slide, please. This is uh, where I live, Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's north of El Paso, Texas. It's in the desert, and um, there's some beautiful mountains close by. They're about eight miles from our house. Uh, this, this is a view from our front, front window. They're called the Oregon Mountains. And um, there are all kinds of interesting wildlife there. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the uh, mushrooms that the people ate in Cleveland. They're Amanita phylloides uh, or Amanita verna type mushrooms. One bite will kill a person. Next, next slide. Uh, picking mushrooms could be like playing uh, Russian roulette. Next, next slide. Uh, this is um, from the newspaper in Plain Dealer. Uh, one of my patients who was. Uh, uh, he, he picked the wrong mushroom and was very sick, and we brought him back to health. Next slide. 
low dose, I'm sorry, alpha lipoic acid for acute hepatic necrosis. That's, that's what it was. Uh, acute liver death, rapid liver cell death. 79 people, terminal liver disease, 75 regenerated livers with just the administration of alpha lipoic acid. I was appointed the Food and Drug Administration Chief Investigator. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, a picture of Dr. Barter uh, on the right. Let me get my pointer out. This is Dr. Fred Barter, who was uh, Chief of Medicine, National Institutes of Health. And that's myself and uh, Dr. Barry Rumack, who was uh, Professor of Medicine, University of Colorado. And um, this is when we were visiting scientists at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Next slide. Well, one of my medical colleagues in Cleveland think about my research. They were very, angry with me. Next slide. Lipoic acid is a very simple molecule. Um, it's octanoic acid, eight carbons with a with an acid group at one end and uh, sulfurs at the other end. Next slide. And lipoic acid does many things. I don't know how many people realize that the reason we're alive is because of alpha lipoic acid. Did you know that? Look, every cell of your body is making it right now in small amounts. It turns your food into energy in the mitochondrion of the cell. This is the main thing it does. And if you talk to your doctor or some scientist or something, they say, never heard of it? My God, I used to teach it 50 times to uh, medical students and graduate students. <laughs> Everyone should remember this. This is the reason we're alive. It changes our food into energy. It also is a great free radical scavenger. It modifies gene expression. In Russia, when somebody, in parts of Russia, if somebody has a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, they give them intravenous alpha lipoic acid and it reverses it immediately. They don't want to hear about this in the United States. It, um, it makes insulin more effective. It, it uh, stimulates immunity. It gets rid of heavy metals. It stimulates organ regeneration. It's the greatest um, glutathione generator in the body. It does lots of, lots of very important things. And, um, you know, people often say, if something does too many, um, has too many actions, it can't be any good. If it was made by nature, if, if it was made by God, if it was given to us, these things are, these types of agents are what keeps us alive. Next slide, please. Some of the things that alpha lipoic acid does in our body. Next slide. See these little organelles, these little structures? These are mitochondria. And in every cell of our body, uh, we have these mitochondria, and they convert your food into energy that keeps us alive. That's where the lipoic acid works, one of the places it works. This is with the oxygen. Next slide. And this is actually um, chemically what it does. It converts, during this process of glycolysis, sugar is converted into something called pyruvate. And this is where, where, the, where this pyruvate is burnt to produce energy to keep us alive. Lipoic acid is the key to this, it turns this into this. Now cancer cells just do this. Did you know that? Cancer cells don't require a mitochondrion. Their mitochondria are defective. Regular healthy cells need a good functional mitochondrion. Next slide. 
So food is converted into pyruvate. Cancer cells just go that far. They actually turn this into something called lactate. This is where energy is produced. The key from this to this is alpha lipoic acid. Next slide. So lipoic acid forces anaerobic metabolism into aerobic metabolism, which is normal metabolism in humans and uh, mammals. Next slide. So lipoic acid is the fundamental regulator of oxygen metabolism in plants, animals, fungi, and several bacteria. Next slide. Without lipoic acid, all air-breathing organisms would be dead. Next slide. Since a young person produces tremendous amounts of alpha lipoic acid, what if you give him a Thanksgiving meal? What's he going to be doing? He's going to be climbing the walls, running around the house. He's converting this food into energy. What if you give it to an 80-year-old man? He'll be sleeping on the couch, won't he? Unless you give him alpha lipoic acid, he'll be walking around the house then. Next slide. Yeah, there's the 80-year-old guy. <laughs> Next slide. Well, what if a mitochondria re receives too much alpha lipoic acid? Well, it starts revving up faster and faster and faster, heating up and heating up, and then guess what? It blows up. Dr. Couch, Dr. V. Hill, and some others did a study of what it would take to kill a primate with alpha lipoic acid. I was asked to be part of this study, but I, it was done with monkeys, and I, I, I like monkeys better than some people, so I <laughs> wouldn't do it. Next slide. Following these studies, I was asked to observe the uh, autopsies of these monkeys and perform the electron microscopy work uh, on the damaged uh. tissues at New Mexico State University. Uh, when af after these monkeys received too much alpha lipoic acid, tremendous amounts, there were actually dead areas in the liver and the kidneys and the heart and the large muscles of the legs and arms. Next slide, please. Here's a normal mitochondrion. And you can see these membranes, really beautiful. These are the mitochondria after too much lipoic acid. Tremendous amounts. So lipoic acid, very, very high doses, can be very toxic. But water is very toxic in very high doses. Salt is, is very toxic. Um, it takes about 100 milligrams per kilogram to kill a person with alpha lipoic acid, which is tremendous, tremendous amounts intravenously. Next slide. So we published this in one of the big journals. Dr. V. Hill, myself, Dr. Garcia from Emory University. A liver mitochondria suffered severe structural damage in extremely high doses of alpha lipoic acid. A next next uh, slide. If lipoic acid worked for acute liver disease, would it be effective for chronic liver disease, like uh, autoimmune hepatitis, hepatitis C, cirrhosis of the liver? primary biliary cholangitis, progressive sclerosing cholangitis. Next slide. This is what we hate to see, a cirrhotic liver. Next, please. Here's one of our patients. Came in a few years ago. End-stage liver disease. Here's the guy. He had uh, his belly filled with fluid. Very, very sick. His mother actually dragged him in. He didn't want to go. They told him he had a few weeks to live without a transplant. We put him on our program. This is two years later. Completely regrew his liver, no sign of liver disease. Next slide. And they say that's impossible. Hepatitis C. I developed the uh, triple antioxidant therapy for, um, for hepatitis C 
um, in Germany in 1999. Next slide. And we use uh, alpha lipoic acid, 300 milligrams twice a day to regenerate the healthy liver cells that were left. Oral selenium, selenium is a uh, birth control pill for many viruses. When selenium levels go up into a certain point, viruses have trouble replicating. And silly marin, which protects the liver from further damage. And if they're really sick, we give them IV lipoic acid. Next, next slide. This is an electron micrograph of um, a person with hepatitis C, and these are the hepatitis C viruses within the cell. You know what that thing is? It's a mitochondrion. Next slide. Okay, alpha lipoic acid stimulates healthy stem cells to regenerate vigorous new tissue. Next slide, please. What are the most important laboratory tests for liver disease? The platelet count, the albumin, the time it takes your blood to clot, and last, which a lot of doctors think are most important, is the liver enzymes. The platelet count, if the platelet count goes down, if the liver is damaged, there's back pressure in this blood vessel called the portal vein. And the um, spleen is also attached to this. So the spleen swells up like a, like a balloon, like a water balloon, and platelets get caught in it. So people with liver disease have low platelet counts. The albumin is probably the most important test for the liver. A sick liver cannot have a high albumin. Sick livers have low albumins. The prothrombin time, the time it takes your blood to clot is very important because the liver makes the clotting factors. And the ALT just shows liver damage. But you know, the sickest livers, the cirrhotic livers have low liver enzymes. You know why? because there's very little liver left to break down. Next, please. A typical patient, 40-year-old woman, Mrs. KV, developed hepatitis C from a blood transfusion. The uh, liver expert said she is seriously ill and must be treated. Next slide. We put her on our triple antioxidant therapy. Next, please. Her platelet count went from that to that, from 150, from about 140,000 up to around 300,000. Next. Her albumin level went from, let's see, 4.2 to 5 something. Next slide. Her um, liver enzymes went from more than 300 down to normal. Next. And her prothrombin time went from 14, which is high normal, to completely normal. Next slide. So uh, my regimen for serious liver disease is uh, triple antioxidant therapy plus low-dose ultrexone, <coughs> intravenous lipoic, a diet program of supplements, exercise, sleeps, adequate sunlight, avoidance of alcohol, use of prescription drugs if necessary. Next slide. And um, I published this in a very prestigious journal, the German Journal of Internal Medicine, a conservative triple antioxidant approach to the treatment of hepatitis C. I took three cirrhotic hepatitis C patients in the process of liver transplantation evaluation at university hospitals, administered my program, and three recovered within six months. Next slide. <coughs> this is what I quoted at the end of the article. It appears reasonable that prior to liver transplant surgery evaluation or during the transplant evaluation process that the my program uh, should be considered. This 
significant betterment in the patient's condition, liver transplant surgery may be avoided. And this really pissed off the liver community. I mean, they were, you know, they don't want to regrow livers. They want to cut them out and transplant them. That's where the money is. Next slide. Low dose naltrexone. What does it do? Well, it reduces inflammation. It has many other actions, too. You know, there's a drug in Israel called metencephalin. I think it's about $4,000 an injection. It's an anti-cancer drug. If you take low-dose naltrexone at bedtime for $20 a month, in the morning, your nervous tissue produces metencephalin, which binds the cancer cells and kills them. So for $20 a month, you make your own $4,000 a month drug. Next slide. So low-dose naltrexone fools the brain. Not enough endogenous opiates in the bloodstream. In the morning, you get a flood of endogenous opiates. At least one of them, metencephalin, binds the cancer cells and promotes cell suicide, apoptosis. Others downregulate inflammatory markers. And as a result of this, many autoimmune diseases disappear. The original work was done by Ian Zagan at the Penn State University. And then Dr. Bahari in New York picked this up and used it with people. Next slide. Autoimmune hepatitis. These people usually have a high anti-nuclear antibody. At one time, you know, autoimmune hepatitis was called lupus hepatitis. It's, it's really a type of lupus attacking the liver. Sometimes they have smooth muscle, muscle antibodies elevated or liver, kidney, microsomal type 1 antibody too. Next, please. Well, we, we use the same program for autoimmune hepatitis, and it seems to work. Next, please. In most people, here we have a lady with autoimmune hepatitis. When she came in in 2005, her platelet count was 79,000. It should be over 130,000. And uh, two years later, it was close to 100,000, which is pretty good. Her albumin was really low, 2.5. Uh, in 2007, it was normal. Her liver enzymes are very high, then it became normal. And her clotting time became normal. Her ANA went from 80 to zero. Next slide. Here's another, oh, this is the same lady. Just shows how the ANA went down. Next slide. Here we have another woman with, with um, autoimmune hepatitis. Her, uh, in 2010, her platelets were 95,000. By April 2017, it was 115,000. You see, she did very well. Next slide. <coughs> Same thing. She, her ANA went from 150 down to zero. Next slide. Same thing. Next. What about uh, low-dose naltrexone and uh, lipoic acid for systemic lupus and rheumatoid arthritis? Next slide. Uh, this is a, uh, something that we're preparing for publication. You can see with systemic lupus, these are the kind of results we have with individual people. With rheumatoid arthritis too. Tremendously good results. Very simple. And um, like I say, most conventional medical people don't want to hear about this. It's too simple, too inexpensive. People don't make a lot of money on it. It just helps patients. Next slide. Are there other diseases that lipoic acid might help? Well, lipoic acid is a potential therapy for any chronic disease 
associated with oxidative stress. Most diseases are associated with oxidative stress. Next slide. Oxidative stress in the mammalian heart is reversed by alpha-lipoic acid. People have a heart attack, they give them intravenous lipoic acid right afterwards, it reverses the whole process. Then people wouldn't have to stay in the hospital, the hospitals lose a lot of money. Next slide. What about lipoic acid and diabetes? Henriksen published the first human study to show that lipoic increases insulin stimulated glucose movement into the cell. In other words, it reverses uh, diabetes. Next slide. This study demonstrated that lipoic acid is an effective treatment for diabetic neuropathies and also neuropathies of the cranial nerves leading to full recovery of patients. We do this every day in Las Cruces. Next slide. What about lipoic acid and cancer? By the way, you know, this doesn't work all the time, but it works the majority of the time. Uh, all hallmarks of cancer can be linked to uh, impaired respiration and energy metabolism. Uh, Dr. Warburg uh, wrote about this in 1928. He won a Nobel Prize for this, by the way. And I remember several months ago, I was at a, a conference uh, from MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. And I walked up to the booth uh, where they had a booth. And um, this young oncologist woman hands me a, a tray full of uh, candy. Mars bars, uh, Three Musketeers, Hershey bars. And he said, I can't imagine, I can't imagine a uh, oncologist handing out candy. He said, why? He said, because cancer grows in sugar and iron. And you want to starve the cancer. So well, that's not true. I said, what do you mean it's not true? Warburg proved this in 1928 with his studies. So I never heard of Warburg. I said, have you ever heard of a PET scan? Yes. But why don't you tell me what it is? Well, they take sugar and inject it. Oh my God, I never even thought of that. Could you believe this? I mean, that's how, you know, most, most specialist doctors see things like this. They just can't see anything outside of what they do. So anyway, Warburg uh, found out that that was true. Next slide. This is um, a normal cell with mitochondria and a big nucleus. Next slide. This is a breast cancer cell. The mitochondria, as you can see, are all dried up. They're not functional. Cancer cells don't need mitochondria. They don't need oxygen to grow. They just do the glyco glycolytic pathway. Next slide. Alpha lipoic acid stimulates apoptosis, which is cell suicide, in human breast cancer cells. Published in 2009. Alpha lipoic acid induces cell suicide or death of lung cancer cells. Next slide. At, um, at our clinic, we give intravenous lipoic acid for cancer, intravenous, intravenous vitamin C, hydroxycitrate or hydroxycitrate, various supplements such as artemisinin. You know, somebody won a Nobel Prize for artemisinin a couple of years ago. Nobody even most people have never even heard of it. It's an anti-parasite drug or agent, but it also is very poisonous to cancer cells. And we use various prescription drugs like metformin, which keeps cancer cells from getting too much sugar, aprazolam, which is Xanax. Most people with cancer are nervous, so we relax them a little bit. Cimetidine, which stimulates killer cells to kill cancer. And mabendazole 
You know, mabendazole used to be like $4 a month as an anti-parasite medication. But then, when somebody discovered that it also kills cancer cells, they sort of took it off the market. And you could get it through compounding pharmacies now. It, now it's like $100 a month. But I wrote a prescription uh, for somebody, and rather than going to a compounding pharmacy, they went to Walgreens or Walmart, and it was $22,000 a month <laughs> since they found out it kills cancer. They didn't purchase it there. They, they went to, to uh, the compounding pharmacy. But it's really interesting. Uh, when something is found to be effective, this price goes up tremendously. Next slide. Um, I wrote a paper on the low dose, uh, on the long term survival of a patient with pancreatic cancer stage four in 2006. We published the first human study that demonstrated <laughs> the therapeutic effects of lipoic acid combined with low dose naltrexone for cancer. Next slide. Here's um, a lady, a nurse who uh, had developed, she developed um, hepatitis C from a finger stick. And then she developed um, hep hepatitis C and then it went on to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. Next slide. This is a PET scan. You can see in their liver, every, every light colored um, thing is a cancer. Her liver was just filled with cancer. She went to the university. They said nothing could be done. She'd be dead in a few months. Go to hospice. She came to our office. Next slide. This is um, 28 months later, no sign of cancer in the liver. Next slide. Here's a person with uh, kidney cancer in the left kidney. A patient, I think he was at Baylor University Medical School. Next slide. And um, they took out the kidney, but they discovered a gigantic metastasis to the lungs. And they tried everything, nothing worked. His wife had to carry him into the office. He could hardly even walk. This is in 2010. Next slide. We started treating him. We started feeling better right away. But every time we did a PET scan or a CAT scan, the, the tumor was still in the lungs. Then all of a sudden, in 2014, it disappeared. Next slide. And we published this uh, long-term survival of a patient with stage four renal cell carcinoma in one of the big cancer journals. All of this stuff is published, so anybody tells you <laughs> nobody's ever done any work on these things. They haven't looked at the literature. Next slide. Then we publish another paper on three more people with uh, stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, within six months, the PET scan showed no cancer. Next, please. And the reversal of a B cell lymphoma that was considered terminal. He was a policeman from Chicago. Next slide. This is that fellow. Great big tumors in his neck and his groin. These are the kidneys getting rid of the dye. Next slide. Within six months, no sign of uh, cancer in his, in his uh, groin or his, under his arms. Next one. So I was very surprised when one day I got a call from our National Cancer Institute in Washington. Dr. Uh, Abrams, who's one of the chiefs over there, said, uh, you know, I've been looking at, at your work on, on the, um, in the, looking at the, in the medical literature, and you're getting better results in some of the big cancer hospitals. Can we invite you to Washington and teach us what you're doing? And I said, sure. And I thought they'd really argue with me there. You know, the National Cancer Institute is the most um, prestigious place in the world for cancer. So, um, I went, my daughter, who's a lawyer, says, you know, you better bring a gun with you. They might try to kill you. <laughs> I said, you can't bring a gun to Washington. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I went there and spoke for an hour. And uh, 
They didn't argue. They all stood up and applauded. And then a fellow walked up to me from one of the big Ivy League schools. He says, I'm head of uh, oncology there. He said, you know, I, I've been following your work for years. And I flew down just to meet you from uh, New England. And I says, well, very nice meeting you. What could I do for you? He said, I have an aunt with breast cancer. How should I treat her? I said, what do you do at your institution? I could tell you the institution later, but I don't want it on record. Uh, he said, I'm a board certified oncologist. All I could do is chemotherapy. Everybody does the same thing. Nobody gets in trouble. But I never do it for my own family. Do you believe this? And then Dr. Abrams came up to me and said, you know, this is amazing stuff. It's a, a metabolic reversal of cancer. He said, but don't get your hopes up. He said, the uh, drug companies would never allow this to be on the market. Unless we have a Great Depression. Then, you know, people won't be able to afford that kind of stuff. So a few years later, he calls me up. And he says, you know, I think we're going to have a Great Depression. <laughs> he said, I think this guy Obama is spending so much money that we're going we're gonna to go down the toilet. And then if Hillary gets in, it's going to get even worse. He said, we'd like to invite you back. He said, we'll give you a whole afternoon to speak. Present seven cases of terminal cancers that you've reversed at your clinic. And we'll have our expert oncologists discuss each case. So um, I went there and spoke for a whole afternoon. And uh, their experts went over each case. And they said, hey, this is all valid. And they wrote this big newsletter up from the National Cancer Institute and sent it to all the oncologists in America, which has really got them angry. <laughs> they said, you know, he's not even an oncologist. Why would you invite an oncologist? Why don't you invite me? But you do the same thing everybody else does. You don't do anything different. Next slide, please. So this is what they, they said. They said the cases presented by myself were submitted and given rigorous scientific evaluation by National Cancer Institute um, oncologists. The ultimate goal is to identify these uh, innovative medical interventions that might um, be effective. Dr. Bergson reported the combination of LDN and ALA along with uh, other things caused several cancers that go dormant. Early in his medical career, he published papers uh, repairing liver damage from mushroom poison and chronic uh, infections. He also cited a number of research articles. Yeah, I'm almost finished. <laughs> okay, next slide. Everywhere else in the world are interested in this. In Japan, in, uh, this is from when I was in Scotland. Next slide. Well, lipoic acid summary is uh, necessary for all oxygen breathing organisms. Rate limiting factor for the production of energy from our cells. It forces anaerobic metabolism to aerobic. It does many other things. Next slide. Uh, most pharmaceutical drugs do not address the cause of the disease. They address the symptoms. Lipoic acid gets to where the rubber meets the road and, and turns it around. Next slide. Most of our patients that I see have hepatitis C, autoimmune hepatitis, diabetes, uh, autoimmune disease. You know, we see, we're, we're not seeing cancer people from out of town anymore because um, sometimes, you know, they come in after they're completely almost dead and there's really not much you could do for them. They've gone through the whole system. They, they could hardly, and they go sour when they're, they're in Las Cruces. So we only see people that are fairly local. Next slide. But we see liver disease people from all over. So some of the books that describe my therapies, um, my favorite book is uh, Lipoic Acid Breakthrough. I really should write another one. A Syndrome X was a national bestseller. Honest Medicine, I wrote two chapters in it. My first patient with... Uh, um, reversal of uh, pancreatic cancer wrote a chapter, and my liver cancer person wrote a chapter, and you know, curing Courtney. Next slide. 
Then I wrote two more books, too. Thank you. It was fun. Burning questions, please ask now. Okay. No, go ask them now, right now. Okay. What's your first No, I'll ask. Sit down. Okay. What's your question? It's personal. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Speak real loud. Mitochondria, from what I understand from biology 101, is um, an engulfed um, uh, bacteria, and so many people uh, have, um, think that they're treating themselves with even fermented foods, like any. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, what she's saying is that um, what are what are uh, high-level uh, mammalian cells? They have mitochondria in it. They have several other organelles. But well, what's the origin of this uh, mitochondrion? Biologists say they were ultimately free living bacteria who attacked the early cells and got along so well in them and produced so much energy that it became incorporated in higher type cells. Is that what you were asking? Well, it depends the kind of fermented food. You know, a lot of these fermented foods are full of toxins, you know. And, and they sell them in health food stores, and people love them. They make people sick. Okay, I, I do, I, you know what? We do have a lot of questions. I want to ask you to ask him in the corridor, because we want to bring up the next, in 15 minutes, we're going to bring up Diane Freeman. But I know that you're going to want to talk to him. So please... It's a good time to take your question and ask the person. If there's so many, there's so many. The research program that I'm working on involves collaboration with a Dr. Berkson, who is in private practice in New Mexico. He practices what's called integrative medicine. Integrative medicine is an attempt to help the body heal itself while using conventional medicine. When Dr. Berkson was practicing earlier, he obtained an investigational new drug approval from the FDA to use an injection of lipoic acid in patients that develop diabetic neuropathy. That's damage to the peripheral nerves caused by glucose. We know that's an inflammatory process. Our body synthesizes lipoic acid. It helps us deal with inflammation. He felt that by injecting them, they would improve. They did. He is now treating patients with terminal liver failure. We are going to try to get FDA approval for the OSU Medical School and its clinics to recruit patients with terminal liver failure due to alcohol abuse and see if injecting them with lipoic acid will improve liver function. 